heart of where innovation, money, and power collide in Silicon Valley and beyond. This is Bloomberg Technology with Caroline Hyde and Ed Ludlow. Live from Bloomberg's World Headquarters in New York, I'm Caroline Hyde. And I'm Ed Ludlow. This is Bloomberg Technology. Coming up, more IPO coverage ahead. Clavio becomes the third major U.S. listing in a week. We sit down with the CEO and investors in the company. And Germany wants to ban key parts from Huawei for its 5G mobile network as the country reviews its reliance on Chinese tech. We have more ahead. Plus, Amazon announces a new smart home device and a generative AI-based Alexa. We'll discuss the features with device chief David Lim. Yeah, let's get a check on the markets. This will be quick because we're going nowhere on any asset class related to technology or otherwise. It is Fed Day. We will have special coverage of that Fed decision later this afternoon. And basically, the market sees them holding rates steady. You look at the Nasdaq 100 completely flat. Uh, Nasdaq Golden Dragon Index, it had been slightly outperforming, up a few tenths of 1%. We're going to be talking about US-China relations in the context of tech later in the show, that of Europe as well. US 10-year yield, 4.3%. And then Bitcoin holding at 27,000 US dollars per token. This is the definition, Caroline, of treading water ahead of a big Fed decision. Yeah, all eyes on the macro. Just go micro for a moment, though. The individual stock movers are interesting. There are some updates coming from certain companies. And, and I'm looking at the likes of Intel, for example, has been, well, I mean, pairing an earlier decline, but notably we are seeing it currently off by more than 2%. This is maybe that invasion day didn't live up to expectations. In particular, we wanted some color around the 18A chips. Who are the customers? We didn't get that. We're off by 2%. Apple, I highlight, off by 9 tenths percent. UBS saying the color on iPhone 15 is mixed at best in terms of some of the ultimate desire to be buying in and what are the backlogs looking like. Pinterest on the up more than 4% as it's investor day looks promising monetization there to be had. But what's on the downside? Cart. Let's have a little look at the latest IPO on the block that came yesterday. It's got, it's still higher over the last couple of days. Remember, $32.20, it is above where it priced at $30. But we are coming off of that euphoric high. The pop was in excess of 40% and then ended the day down at a 12% rise. Now we fade that a little bit more as just investors perhaps start to take a little bit of profit in. Uh, let's stick with IPOs. It is the theme of the week of the show and get straight to the third major US listing in a week, marketing and data automation provider Clavio joining us on set. Who else? The man who runs to break news, Ryan Gould. I think we saw that Clavio indicated it opened between $36 to $38, the IPO priced at $30 build up for us towards this listing? Yeah, I mean, it's the second IPO to price a 30 a share this week. Obviously, Instacart priced a 30 a share. I would say, you know, you, Caroline, you've just brought attention to Instacart. Is the, is the sun coming up on IPOs? Maybe, but Ooh, maybe it's just... you're calling it early. You're calling it early. Maybe it's just not quite enough to, you know, fully thaw the frost. And I think that's what we're hearing. It's, you know, let's see what happens today with Clavio. The quotes at 36, 38, of course, we can, uh, there's going to be some shifting around there. But it was, it seemed to be, you know, it's, a, it's the third major offering in a week. Mm. Uh, there's clearly momentum. I spoke to Andrew this morning, uh, Andrew Bielecki, co-founder and CEO. He's joining the show in a bit. He'll be on, in a cho on shortly. And he said, you know, his claim is that if you're a company that has discipline, if you're a company that has good unit economics, you can get out there and investors will listen to you. So I think it's a, it's, a, it's a claim. I'm sure we'll see it in a while. But We're about to st go to a very long-term investor whose real view is this is a company that has capital discipline. What's notable is all of these companies are pricing at the top end of the range. And so they're managing to lock in a decent amount of money, not leaving as much perhaps on the table as some had worried Arm had. Are, mm. Ultimately, who are the players who are wanting to get into these particular deals? Because Clavio is a B2B player, Instacart much more retail focused. Do we know who's trying to buy in on first day? You know, it's a good question because when you think that Clavio is the first IPO pretty much in two years to come from the enterprise software sector, we're used to seeing this particular window prior to Thanksgiving being full of these companies. Obviously, let's take COVID out of the picture and think about 2019 rather than 2021. But this is generally the type of class we're expecting to see because they have the good fundamentals, they have the good unit economics, they have those kinds of those, those, you know, headlines, really, mm -hmm. that a lot of the big investors like T. Rowe and so on will, you know, think about, you know, maybe in the future as, as being part of, the, part of the picture for them. But 
you know, as far as the retail side of, the, of, of, of it goes, I mean, again, we're going to get another test probably in the next couple of weeks with Birkenstock. So we can, I would, yeah, probably, as I say, the frost, the frost not fully thawed. Let's see what happens uh, in a couple of weeks' time. The, the excitement when we have an IPO window like this is, is wide. You have the employees who want some liquidity for their stock. You have the venture capitalists who are coming on the show talking about why they got in early, the bankers who are bankrolling it. You know, what, what's terrific about our deals team is you, you have this on the ground reporting. Is there genuine sustained excitement? In other words, do the sources that we speak to think the IPO window carries on or it's kind of a short-lived euphoria? Ed, you know, I've been covering IPOs for a while and the fact that people are now wanting to take calls to talk about IPOs probably tells us, you know, <laughs> kind of where we're heading. It's just funny that you don't really have to find so much of an excuse anymore to bring up the idea that, you know, there's going to be a company IPOing. You would probably have been laughed out the door maybe as recently as six months ago. But, you know, back to the point, I think, about what drives it for some of these venture capital firms. Of course, you know, in Clavio's case, even, it's still AI. It's, you know, going long on machine learning. These are still the headline buzz, feed, you know, buzz terms that, you know, really help to push these, these offerings. And, you know, if you can get that in front of your investors on the roadshow and, you know, really drill down into why you're going to be at the forefront of those trends, then, you know, they're all, they're all ears. All right, Bloomberg's Ryan Gould, thank you. Get out of here. Go do some reporting. <laughs> Joining us now, I'm absolutely delighted to say, Caroline, John Carlin, Acadian Software Executive Chairman, who was an investor in Clavio in its Series B and Series D. And, John, if you allow me, I just want to tell a bit of your story. You invested $7 million early 2016. At that time, Clavio was 10 people. Just explain to us in the audience what today means to you as one of the original backers. Oh, it's a huge milestone for me and more importantly for the company. It was, uh, it was always a, just an exceptionally unique company. The thing about Andrew and Ed and team is that they were able to grow the business from the earliest stage without running big losses and, and never really need additional funding after that. So now to be here at the, uh, the Center of Commerce on the, on the NYSE floor is kind of amazing given the company was never really about raising huge amounts of money in the early days. <laughs> What it is about is SaaS. It's about software. It's about ensuring that it can help other companies get the right digital message out at the right time. John, how right. much are we seeing them having a moat in this particular instance? How much can they ensure that they rise above the competition now that they're public? Oh boy, I'll tell you what. This is a, there's a pretty, pretty significant moat here. The technology that this company has built from the earliest days has defended its pricing, has defended this, uh, and really been the engine behind this unbelievably efficient growth machine. John, we were just hearing a bit about your story, the fact that you believed in this company before anyone else ultimately, 10 people, 7 million check, followed it on with further checks and the B, the D yeah. rounds. What yeah. ultimately was the recipe for you? What, you said it's capital discipline, but there must have been something else that really got you excited as a general SaaS investor. Andrew and Ed, from the earliest days, they were walking to the beat of their own drum. They are pretty unconventional entrepreneurs and that they were super focused on the customer, super focused on building product, not really interested in talking to investors. That's a different type of recipe and uh, it, it really got me excited in the early days because they were so technology and product centric. John, can I ask you how you're going to yourself transact in this listing and IPO? You know, will you remain a long-term investor of Clavio? Yeah, so as an early stage investor, we sold 18%, which was sort of a pro rata amount that the early stage investors here did. And I'm a really proud holder of the, of the remaining shares there. I have absolutely no intention to sell anytime soon. You uh, would note something, I think, that we discussed with Ryan, that this is the first company in the space to go public for quite some time, go public in two years. We're talking SaaS enterprise, call it what you will, automation. D does that signal anything more broadly to you about what's happened in the last two years with attitudes towards higher multiple um, software companies? Yeah, sure. Obviously, it's been, a, uh, it's been a pretty long dry spell for software IPOs. But at the end of the day, uh, the thing that hasn't changed at all and what's most important, you pull the lens back here and the general tailwind for software automation throughout the economy, that's the thing that's not gone away. There's sort of no sign of any movement. It's, it's, uh, it, it's, it, it's happening as aggressively as it ever has. And so for this is a good milestone, uh, Clavio to be the first one to go public. I think it says something about the quality of the company, but probably most importantly, there's nothing slowing down uh, the demand for software adoption. 
What's not slowing down at the moment is the hype around artificial intelligence too, John. How much has that had to become part of the business model and part of the messaging, or did they not particularly adopt that? Oh, no, absolutely. I think, I think the interesting thing with Clavio is that uh, machine learning has always been at the core of the product. And so uh, maybe messaging has been catching up a little bit lately with a business like this one over the last you know, six, 12 months, but it's always been core to what the business does. Uh, John, we're indicated to open in between $36 and $38. We priced at $30. Just talk to me about the day itself and, and what you're feeling right now on the floor of the New York Stock Exchange. Uh, yes, yeah, an emotional day. I was looking around and we had 300 Clavios here uh, today on the floor joining the celebration. A lot of OGs uh, that I was catching hadn't seen uh, in a long time. It's a special moment for that group, but as Andrew and Ed uh, said uh, recently, this morning, they're kind of 1% done. That's always been their mantra. I wouldn't, uh, I wouldn't bet against them. <laughs> John Carlin, thank you for your time today. We'll let you get back to the celebrations and waiting Thank for it you. to start trading. <laughs> Acadian <laughs> Software Executive. You. Thank you, Tay Well. He's the chairman there. And meanwhile, look, we've been talking so much about AI and ultimately not only the hype factor, but perhaps some of the risks and indeed the regulation. I caught up earlier with the Meta President of Global Affairs, that's Nick Clegg, is at a Concordia Summit in New York City, where we talked about all of those other things, particularly also about the open source nature in which, well, Llama 2 in particular has been rolled out. Just take a listen. It's foundational technology. It's, the, it's, like a sort of, it's like an operating system. It's, it, it's something which pervades everything. And, and lots of things will be built on top of it. Of course, you can never perfectly predict how it will be used. And you can't perfectly sort of litigate for that in advance. And no doubt there will be people who will try and use it for bad purposes. But in general, it is accepted in the sector that open sourcing these things leads to safer models because you, because you, you can then openly look for vulnerabilities and, 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 and fix them. And, and that's certainly the attitude that we believe is right at this stage on this great AI journey. Just take hate speech. The prevalence of hate speech on Facebook now is down to about 0.02%. And by the way, that's not, I'm not just making that up. That's stuff that we, stats we publish every, every quarter, and they're audited by, I think it's EY independently, so we're not just marking our own homework. So that for every 10,000 bits of content that you'd see online on Facebook, two bits of content might be hate speech. And, and that is down by about 50, 60% over the last couple of years for one reason only. AI, because our classifiers are just getting much better. So I think it's worth remembering, particularly, and you and I talked about this um, backstage, particularly in advance of all of these hugely consequential elections which are happening next year, India, the US, Mexico, the European Union, possibly the UK, and so on, um, that, that yes, generative AI might enable bad people to try and generate bad and misleading content more quickly. It also allows platforms like us to act against that much more quickly. So it, it is an adversarial space where, where, where hopefully, and that's our task, we use, that we can use those tools more nimbly and more effective than, than, than our adversaries. The sooner we can get beyond the kind of, oh my gosh, is it going to be the end of the world kind of thing, which I think has a paralyzing effect on the debate. It, 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 it doesn't, it just kind of goes, ah! And when there's bias in the here and now. And all, yes, I, I think there are a lot of here and now issues that we can deal with, uh, whether it's elections, whether it's misinformation, whether it's transparency, whether it's provenance. And I, 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 I certainly urge lawmakers to kind of, you know, fixate on that. Meta President of Global Affairs, Nick Clegg. And, and we were really broad in... Look, Nick Clegg's someone who worked as a Member of Parliament in Europe, so he understands yep. the European Commission he worked there, who is a government official, of course. I mean, Deputy he led Prime a government, the Deputy Prime Minister, yeah. He understands that, but I asked, what about China? Yeah. And well, it's, a, it's, it's top of mind for every tech company, largely in the context of AI. So all I'll say is, to our global Bloomberg Technology audience, go and check out the full panel because China was one of the surprising elements mm. of that conversation. All right, coming up, Huawei, speaking of China, remains in the middle of increased tensions between the US and China. More on how US officials are responding to the Mate 60 Pro handset and China's latest accusations against the US. This is Bloomberg Technology.
OK, time for Talking Tech. This is what we're seeing in the news. First up, WhatsApp users will now be able to pay for services in India using the app. Parent company Meta is expanding the feature to that country after launching it in Brazil and Singapore. Payments will be free for consumers. However, businesses will pay a processing fee similar to a credit card transaction. And Apple Store workers in France have called for a national strike this weekend, right as the iPhone 15 is set to go on sale. A group of unions are in pay negotiation talks with Apple France, pushing for a 7% increase to offset inflation. Apple has offered a 4.5% increase. The company has not responded to our requests for comment. Plus, US Commerce Secretary Gino Raimondo is raising concerns over the speed and scale of China's technological advancements. During a congressional hearing Tuesday, Raimondo said the release of Huawei's Mate 60 Pro phone with an advanced chip had upset her. But she also noted that the US has no evidence that China can make those phones components en masse. Caroline. I mean, let's stick with that theme because the US isn't the only country suspicious of China technology, Huawei's technology in particular. Look, Germany's interior ministry wants to ban key Huawei parts from its own 5G mobile network. Let's get the context. Nimbag's Oliver Crook is with us. And Oli, what's at stake here? How integral is Huawei to Germany's technology infrastructure? Well, one of the issues is they actually don't know. So this is a debate that dates back to the Merkel era, but the question of whether or not they would have Huawei in the 5G network, the Merkel era okayed it. Of course, we all know a lot has changed since the Merkel era, particularly in the relationship with China. The problem is they don't know the volume of, of hardware that is in this network and how dependent they are. So they launched an audit in the spring to try to figure that out. And the government didn't really keep track of it. So now we understand the Interior Ministry, as you say, is pushing to ban Huawei and ZTE from the, the 5G network. This could be potentially a huge undertaking, particularly because right. they don't know how much of it there is. And this is all part of the de-risking. And this is a new category of de-risking, all in the wake of the Russian invasion of Ukraine, you know, Russian gas. But now it's really about Chinese tech. The, the, I've... This is a technology and infrastructure story. I remember going through the 5G super cycle in this country, North America, it took years of getting the infrastructure in place before there was any coverage at all. What's the timeline for Germany? You can't just say, you know what, we're not going to use that anymore. We're going to get over with someone else. Well, there has been a number of timelines, but one of them is get it all out by 2026. That's what we understand from some of the talks, which is a very abbreviated timeline, particularly for Germany, which is not particularly known for going at light speed for this sort of thing. <laughs> this sort of thing. But again, the audit isn't done yet. It still needs to go through a number of other ministries, and they're going to have to consult with the network providers. But basically, Deutsche Telekom has said this is totally unrealistic. The UK, which is trying to do something very similar, has set out a timeline from seven to ten years. But there's going to be really a real a, a debate in weighing all the pros and cons and again a nation that is sort of behind in digital infrastructure i mean very briefly who do they turn to if it's not huawei ericsson i mean what? where are they getting the tech from yeah, it'll be Ericsson and Nokia, but that comes with a number of questions itself. Do they have the volume of material that they need in the amount of time? At what cost? You know, there are not a lot of cheap alternatives for Russian gas or Chinese tech. And the third question is, really, is the cost of development for the digital infrastructure in Germany? Germany has some of the lowest fiber penetration in all of Europe. We're talking about 8% of households have fiber in Germany. It's 51% in France and 81% in Spain. So they're already behind and they need to play catch up. All right, Bloomberg's Oliver Crook out in Germany. Good to catch up. Thank you. Uh, switching gears very quickly, Neuralink is taking the next steps to make science fiction closer to reality. The brain implant startup led by Elon Musk is seeking out patients in its first clinical trial. Neuralink is asking for people with quadriplegia due to spinal cord injury or ALS. And Caroline, this is a story that caught your eye. It, it, it's... It is fast moving. Mm. They have the FDA exemption for an investigational device and they have a hospital on board to perform the procedure. What Who's do you make of it? They're putting their hands up. I mean, ultimately, we know that there's been the view on animals. We're now looking at real life impact. This is, again, an Elon Musk company of which, what, there's six or seven now, but really pushing technology forward in a, in a deeply sort of untrodden space yeah. and I think again it's just about the safety the precautions that come into place and ultimately who ends up driving forward this sort of technology the, the long-term promise is to reverse the impacts of severe yeah. severe brain and spinal injury but in the first instance Neuralink is talking about using the human brain with the implant to move a mouse cursor right this is the kind of small steps that we're taking but it was really interesting to see them say, OK, let's get on with it. Yeah, and I think in many ways, artificial intelligence, again, something that people are depending on in this particular area.
Meanwhile, coming up, look, we've got so much to get back to in the world of IPO land. Clavio, third major US listing this week, prepares to start trading. We'll break down the details of the IPO next. Maybe we'll even get a price. This is Bloomberg Technology. Time now for work shifting. It's look, time that we look at the changing landscape of the labor market amid some advances in technology. Today, we're going to focus on how much more adept you are at marketing and automation in particular of the software that goes with it. Because Clavio, it is going public. What does the company do? Let's ask Katie Roof. And really, this is all about helping brands target you and I in the most efficient and effective manner, right? Sure, yeah. So they do uh, email marketing, text marketing. They work with brands from Unilever. They work with uh, popular sunscreen brand Supergoop and jeans brand Good American. They're helping uh, reach out to their customers over email and uh, text. Just remind our audience that Clavio indicated it's open at $36 to $38 a share. The IPO had priced at $30 a share, KD been a busy week for you, busy 10 days. You know, where does this listing <laughs> compare with those that have gone before? Yeah, and so it's interesting because all three of these big tech companies that are going public right now are in very distinct subsectors within tech. And so there's talk about if Clavio goes well, that it could open up the window for the SaaS market. Obviously, enterprise software is a big part of what venture capitalists invest in. And for a while, we saw many companies going public in that category. Um, certainly, Clavio is very different than many of those companies, but the closer we can get any sort of indication of investor, public investor interest, um, you know, then that helps uh, build confidence for those other companies that are preparing to go public. And I think Bloomberg Intelligence has done some great analysis really on the ultimate valuation that we're getting in this company at around about, what, $9 billion after you look at the $30 price point. And that's kind of in line, if not a little bit toppy when you're looking at other software SaaS companies out there, the Adobe's of this world. So it's pretty large for a venture-backed company going public that's an enterprise software. A lot of times we see companies in that category going public that are maybe $1 billion, $2 billion in, in size. So uh, I think it's actually would be getting more attention, but it's been a little yes. bit overshadowed by Arm and Instacart. But it's a big company out of Boston, and uh, people in the industry are watching this one closely. All right, Bloomberg's Katie Ruth, thank you. And stay tuned. Coming up on the show, Clavio's CEO. Andrew Bialecki is going to join us as soon as we get to the New York Stock Exchange. This is Bloomberg Technology. Welcome back to Bloomberg Technology. I'm Caroline Hyde. And I'm Ed Ludlow. We are standing by for Clavio to start trading. Indicated open $36, $38 a share. The IPO price at $30 a share. Bloomberg Shanali Basak is with us and has been lamenting off camera that after this IPO, she's going to have to wait for another <laughs> flood of IPOs. But tell us why you're watching this one so closely. A few reasons. One, for the banks, it is a reopening for them as well. Remember, they have not had any uh, significant business besides Kenview this year. And even when you look at can view it's kind of traded sideways so after this set of, res of results or IPOs rather you have these fairly significant pops for the market that we're in but what happens to the window after that Birkenstocks may uh, tr try to list in the coming weeks there could be some choppiness in the market, but it would really be Q1 until we see the next wave of listings, SaaS or not. Uh, and so I think there's a lot of skepticism out there on how much the, the window is actually open after Clavio. But I don't want to take that away from Goldman Sachs, Morgan Stanley, and Citigroup, which uh, are the lead underwriters on this particular deal. Win for Nicey. The last two were on NASDAQ. Mm -hmm. So a uh, big win for those players at the very least. Let's go over to that nicey. Shanali Bassett, we thank you for that setup because standing by at the New York Stock Exchange is Andrew Bialecki, Clavio's CEO. We don't want to take away this day from you. You're standing by waiting for the first trade. What has this ride been like, Andrew? Oh, man, it's been a great day. Um, just so thankful for the 1,500 Clavios around the world 
130,000 customers that have bet on us. We had some of our customers join us today on the floor. The 5,000 partners we have, um, it's, a, it's a very humbling experience. We're very excited about what we've built. Uh, we're going to have a little fun today, and then we're excited to get back to work tomorrow. Andrew, John Carlin, one of your first investors, joined us on the show. He spoke about how justified this opportunity is for your business in particular. Your stock is indicated to open between $36 to $38 a share. You IPO'd at $30. How do those numbers make you feel? You know, we don't... I, we feel great about the business that we've built. Um, and you know what, we don't, type, don't spend a lot of time uh, focusing on the stock price. We're just gonna keep focusing on customers, uh, keep growing this business. We think we're very early. We've got a really durable business model and we're playing to some big macro trends. You know, businesses getting close to their customers, building digital relationships with the data that they own. Um, which is yeah. a long way to go. Talk about those 130,000 more than paying users and how much they want to see their marketing strategies really intensified by generative AI. It's interesting that that's been the playbook of the last couple of IPOs. Is that something you've lent into? Is that a macro trend that was already there and you're embracing it earlier? Yeah, we've, we've had a whole team dedicated to machine learning and AI uh, for the last five or six years. Um, so we're excited to you know, use some of the large language model technology. But I'll tell you, customers like TaylorMade, uh, Cotty Brands, Unilever, uh, Skims. We've got so many customers, and we believe that the future of, let's just take marketing as one application, the future is software that knows how to use itself. Um, take marketing, instead of building a marketing campaign where a user, you know, a customer, a marketer has to figure out what's the right design, I think the future is uh, the software is going to help guide them so that they can be more successful, you know, aided by all of the data that we have, the collective Clavio ecosystem. You know, Andrew, you note the data, but what is your technological point of difference? What is it that Clavio can do that no one else can? Sure. Yeah, we actually started Clavio as a database, a data infrastructure company. Um, and we spent a lot of time uh, architecting a database that is good at both the kind of machine learning analytical queries that folks run, but also that can power real-time use cases. Like, for instance, what we do with messaging, uh, other marketing. So I think that's the future. I mean, for us, it's a, we've thought about this database as kind of the brain of a business. And uh, uh, on top of that brain, you can build all these different software applications. So we built one with marketing, but boy, there's a long way to go. You, of course, are a global company. 1,500 employees, you're across 80 com countries if you're looking at your customers. Where are you going to be deploying your newly raised money? Is it about talent? Is it about marketing? Where next? Well, it's always about talent. We're always looking for really driven folks to come join us. Uh, but yeah, I mean, you know, we have larger, we started the business focused on small businesses. My co-founder, Ed and I, we have a lot of small businesses and even our families. Uh, what we found is Clave is actually a great fit for small businesses and large enterprises. Uh, so we're going to be moving up market. Uh, and then international expansion, I'm so excited about all of the Clavios we have in our London office, our Sydney office, all the way around the world. Uh, I think there are millions of businesses that should be running on Clavio, uh, and we're excited to take our technology to more of them. Andrew, I appreciate that we haven't even started trading yet. I know that you're excited, you have a long day ahead of you, but what is priority number one when you wake up tomorrow for Clavio? Uh, well, priority would probably be my, make my kids breakfast, but after that, <laughs> uh, you know, look, we're, I, I have a lot of thank you notes to write, a lot of people to, you know, celebrate. Um, I've started doing some of that this afternoon. I'm just, I'm so proud of what 1,500 people have put in over the last decade, and, uh, you know, the best is yet to come. You're Boston-based, so maybe you hot-foot it back on the East Coast to wake up with the kids and have them breakfast. What does it mean for the Boston ecosystem here, Andrew? You know, it's, it's interesting. We're a global company, but, uh, you know, both my co-founder, Ed, and I, uh, we love the Boston ecosystem. And I've been so privileged uh, to get to know a lot of the public company CEOs in Boston, in the you know, New England area. They've been so supportive of us. Uh, I am very excited, you know, in the next coming years, coming decades, to pay it forward. I think there are so many talented folks building in and around Boston, and uh, I'd love to help them however I can. I'll give you a second there, Andrew, just to put your earpiece back in. There you go. Look, IPOs are all about numbers. Caroline and I obsess over them, but there's also this kind of public image side of the story. Have you already seen any traction from new customers that have engaged with you because of the big, shiny IPO that you're doing? 
I think so. Well, the way we think about it is that uh, part of being a public company is showing the world you know, how you run your business and saying that you're going to be there for a long time. That's a big reason why we went public today. Uh, I've talked with so many of our customers and said, we love what Clavio's doing. Are you guys going to be in it for the long run? And the answer is yes. And I think this moment is just another vote of confidence, you know, another way to show that, yes, if you want to build a business, if you're in it for the long run, we're there with you. We're going to help you grow, get closer to your customers. And whatever your dreams are, our mission is to help people own their destiny. Um, we're just excited, excited to keep doing it. You've got to own your investor base now, Andrew. And how do you feel that that narrative changes the way you run a business? The investors that have been with you for an awfully long time, do they stick with you? What sort of buyers do you want to be seeing today? Yeah, the, I, you know, we've had, you know, Ed and I have had a point of view on investors. You, you find people that believe in what you believe in. Uh, we believe in aiming long term, getting close to customers, uh, being a disciplined company. Uh, I'm really excited for our public shareholders. Um, you know, and, and to have them. And, and, and look, if you believe in those things, then, um, you know, we're going to be excited to work with, uh, work with those folks. I'm going to let you rip that earpiece out and hand it back to the cameraman <laughs> operator now. Is, sorry, we'll yeah. get you a bigger one next time, Andrew. <laughs> you've Very been, good. Yeah, sorry, my bad. Yeah, no, no you've been a joy. No, we thank you so much for joining us. And we're excited to see where the first trade takes you. Go back with the team. Andrew Berlecki, he's the Clavio CEO on the day of trade. Meanwhile, coming up, how a Danish medical software startup is competing with big tech giants in the lucrative healthcare market. We're talking funding, but still not public yet. Corti CEO Andreas Plieb is going to be with us. Atomico partner as well, Laura Connell. Join us next. This is Bloomberg Technology. Corti, it's a Danish medical software startup. It's just raised $60 million to sell an AI co-pilot to more hospitals, basically compete with the likes of Microsoft, Amazon, other tech giants racing into the healthcare space. Let's bring in, of course, its CEO, Andreas Cleave, as well as co-founder for the business. And alongside the investor, Laura Connell, partner at Atomico, which we're helping with the fundraise here. And I start with you, Andreas. What exactly are you bringing? How are you augmenting people who are going to treat people in hospitals, what is the co-pilot allowing them to do? So thanks for asking. We are augmenting the professional. So we're a tool that sits on the side of the patient and the professional as they have an interaction or a consultation. So imagine a small digital assistant that as the conversation progresses in real time, will be taking notes, will be journaling the conversation, We'll be comparing symptom descriptions to more than 50 million other patients. We'll try to help the healthcare professionals steer the conversation to the best possible outcome with the least amount of administration burden happening afterwards. And hopefully not only will that free up a ton of time, but it will also make sure that the professional has all the time to focus on the patient and not the paperwork while they're interacting. And no. I think all of us who've tried healthcare think that's really important. Laura, you were helping lead Atomico's investment in Corti. You've got an AI focus, an enterprise SaaS focus, a fintech focus. What drew you towards Corti? Yeah, uh, thank you for asking. Uh, at Atomico, what we're most focused on is trying to invest in and back teams and founders who are really trying to solve some of the mo most important generational issues that we face. I think few people disagree that healthcare and health tech is one of the key areas that we most need to fund. So we spent a lot of time looking at the full value chain and figuring out where along the value chain we thought that some of the latest developments in AI could most help, not only in terms of improving patient care outcomes, but also in driving cost efficiency and revenue optimization for key hospital providers who, as we know, are buckling under the strains of inflation, resource constraints, and a frontline care worker um, you know, health force that is really struggling with, uh, with things like burnout and depression post the COVID. You know, Andreas, AI is the, is the technology, but I'm, I'm actually just interested in the data. There are many giant technology companies working out how they can enter this healthcare space. I was in Cupertino last week at Apple, right? Theirs is more about emergency situation detection, but it's machine learning based. Do you look at the likes of Apple and worry that they similarly want to be a part of this healthcare process, the same part that you're occupying? I think it's uh, exciting to see more big vendors entering the space. 
But I also think we've all now tried many of these new AI technologies and found them lacking. And what we come with is a uniquely vertical AI system. And for the layperson, that means it's uniquely specialized in one thing, and that is actually healthcare interactions. And that's still unique because a lot of the big systems are still built for the, the horizontal use cases, the very like average everyday use cases, whereas we're very focused mm. on this exact interaction. We're just going to pause this conversation for a moment. We have some breaking news of Clavio opening at $36.75. We have the opening price for the initial public offering of Clavio. $36.75 is currently where we trade. So a big uplift from the $30 where they priced. Now, ultimately, Ed, we are seeing once again a pop in the latest ipo we've been sitting here wondering how instacart was going to be performing on the day they had a 40 percent pop at the open we know that arm also traded significantly higher but notably we are seeing these companies taking advantage of this window and managing to line up the demand and the supply side once again this is a company that had cornerstone investors but perhaps more at the uh more desirable a right. area of finance and um, shanali and Abigail Doolittle is standing by. Let's go to Abigail first, who's just here with the opening trade. Yeah, well, we have another exciting IPO here, the third large one in a week right now. We have the shares of Clavio up 21%, so really very positive. And of course, it priced at $30. That was uh, above uh, where they were initially marketing this IPO at 27 to 29. And just today, we saw a bunch of different ranges, 36 to 38, uh, from 34 to 36. This IPO was 30 times oversubscribed. So right now, it seems very, very successful. A valuation of about $11 billion. And of course, you just had that wonderful uh, interview uh, with the CEO and their what some are calling bread and butter technology. This may be a good sense for next year. A lot of people are looking at these IPOs to see, uh, is it greasing the runway for next year, especially around um, technology IPOs. Now, on the other hand, it's interesting because we do, of course, have the Fed later today. We still have some inflation concerns. That's what's kept the IPO window largely closed this year. So we continue to have this big question of whether or not uh, we are now seeing uh, the reopening of the window successfully. Now, we don't know that yet because while Arm was very successful on its first day, it's traded back down there uh, from Instacart. Same thing yesterday, up about 12%. Uh, now coming in a little bit, but overall, very successful start here for Clavio, uh, up 21%. Abigail Doodle, literally running to set, breathlessly telling us about, well, the pop that we're seeing of 23%. Shanali Basak has been standing by waiting for this opening trade. And, you know, this is once again about cornerstone investors. This is once again about limiting supply and ensuring that this has been really well managed by some of the banks. Yeah, the management of this IPO with the cornerstone investors, Alliance Bernstein, BlackRock. Remember, top 10 clients took 55% of the deal, while the top 25 took 80% of the offering. That left roughly 200 investors with no allocation at all. Yet you look at this, and that's according to Amy Orr, who has been reporting on, on this through her sources. $11 billion company at the opening trade at $36.75. That is what you have Clavio now valued at in the market, give or take. You have it fluctuating slightly in the market. That 22% pop, that was less than what you saw at Instacart, despite those 200 investors getting no allocation at mm -hmm. all. It will be interesting. Now, we are just hours away from a Fed decision. And so let's see where Clavio ends the day and goes into tomorrow. The end of this week is an important moment for both Clavio and Instacart, because now that these IPOs, the price itself have gone so successfully supply has been limited big investors bought in right it will matter a lot to these employees as you know, well as these investors the, the, the corner stone investors are important but the, the IPO is a test of how much risk appetite there is out there for a high multiple software stock you hear the, the words of the street Wall Street is the risk appetite there What's interesting is we're going to watch Instacart and Clavio post not too long from now their first set of earnings reports. Those will be very important landmarks for these companies because as we've been talking about, there are really only a few more IPOs left this year, perhaps Birkenstocks, perhaps Turo, as you've been talking about, Caroline. But it's really in the middle of next year, early next year, that you're going to see the bulk of these companies try to go public. Therefore, the results that these companies mm -hmm. post and the investor appetite continuing on is important. Lastly, I would say for the employees, uh, I was you just go to the filings, the SEC 
EEOC filings of Clavio, and one of the things you see is the contract, the employment contract for the chief people officer they brought in, uh, and the stock options that she gets on the back of this as well. You think about all these companies. This was a company founded in 2012. These companies' uh, employees have been locked up for a long time, so these stock listings are just as important for those employees as they are for these new cornerstone investors as we've been talking about. Okay, everyone take a breath. Bloomberg, Shanali, Basak, thank you. And as she just noted, she's going to have to wait a little while for another IPO anyway. Next up, Amazon is launching a revamped Echo Show 8 smart home device and updated Alexa with, finally, new generative AI features. That and much more was announced earlier today at Amazon's product event, its first in-person gadget unveiling since the pandemic. And we're delighted to bring in David Limp, Senior Vice President of Amazon Devices and Services, who's joining us from the company's new campus near Washington, D.C. Dave, you and I have done so many interviews over the years, but you did announce that you would retire at the end of this year. We will get to that. First <laughs> off, let's start with this generative AI integration into Alexa. How are you guys going to roll that out over the coming weeks and months? Because other tech companies have been so conservative about putting generative AI tools into the real world. Yeah, be, by the end of the year, we're going to offer a free preview to uh, anybody that has an Alexa endpoint uh, out there, an Echo, and, and we're going to do that in a way that you can get into the experience a couple different ways. Uh, we're kind of reinventing how we do entertainment on Fire TV. We're doing some things in the smart home, and then we're offering a Let's Chat experience that uh, is super conversational. We showed it on stage today, and it, it, it's, it's remarkable. Uh, and I think the big thing we were able to do is actually optimize a large language model and generative AI for the home, uh, which is a very different environment than, than the tab of your browser. The, the emphasis is conversation and real world application. I told our audience on social media that you were coming on and we always take audience questions, Dave. One is a, is a, is a pretty straightforward one. Will Amazon use Alexa devices to listen in the home as part of training of the large language model that powers the generative AI tool. Of course, there is history here about data privacy. Oh, of course, and you know, I, one of the things we emphasize today is that privacy is foundational to what we're doing here. And you know, it take and so it, we give the best way we do here is is that we give controls to customers. If you want to delete all your utterances, there's a single button that will delete your entire history. If you want to delete your smart home history, there's a single button that allows you to delete that whole history. If you want a more personalized uh, scenario and more personalized types of things so that it recognizes you and personalizes the stuff to your screen, then we do use that information to train the model. But if, if a customer doesn't want it to be personalized, they want a more generic version of Alexa, that's fine too, and we give them that control. I need it not to listen to my children, David. Meanwhile, <laughs> I'm, I'm listening and to the, some of the news that have been unveiled, and not only about new AI, generative AI within Alexa and some of the new Echo Show 8, but a billion Alexa devices have been purchased. Can you just break down exactly what you mean by those one billion? What kind of devices, where, how, when? Yeah, it's, uh, we're talking about the number of devices connected to Alexa, and that's uh, approaching a billion. It's getting very, very close. Uh, a, a bunch of those are Echoes. Uh, there are a bunch of third-party devices as well that have Echo and Alexa inside of it, things like you know BMW vehicles and Sonos smart speakers. And then there's a, a, a over 400 million smart home devices you know, that, that have been connected to. And so we're really seeing kind of a, a continued momentum, uh, you know, and we're kind of lapping the pandemic, but we're still seeing this growth in engagement and, and growth in uh, how people are using Alexa. I mean, when you first launched the first device, the Kindle, just the amount of change that has gone on yes. since then, the, and, and indeed the way that you, we want to stay informed, we have become aware of the way our data is used. And some of the regulatory environment, David, when you're launching new products that integrate very cutting edge technology, how are you thinking about the way in which regulation is going to be changing into that unveiling? Yeah, obviously, we have to take into account laws. We're never going to build products and services that are going to break the laws. But when it comes to AI, the most important thing is we build uh, an AI that's responsible, 
that's uh, safe and that is uh, trusted by customers. You know, and so what we've and it's, I think that's even more true when you're going to put this AI into your home uh, in the form of Alexa versus if you were putting it in, you know in, on your personal computer or elsewhere. And so uh, we're doing a lot to build guardrails around our AI to make sure that it is as responsible as we know how to make it. And it, because we're interconnecting it to your home, we're also doing a lot to try to uh, reduce this idea of hallucination. You know, what, the last thing you want is for you or your kids to say, turn on the living room light, and all of a sudden it turns on the garage door light. Then that, that, that assistant is not going to be used after a little bit longer. So, so the, we're, we're spending a lot of time there as well. Uh, Dave, you know, I've, I've lived in the United States for almost six years now. I've enjoyed these interviews with you talking about hardware and its role in, in the Alexa ecosystem. Bloomberg's reported that Panos Pane left Microsoft, where he led hardware, and is joining Amazon. Are you able to confirm that's who's replacing you in any of your retirement plans by the end of the year? Uh, we don't have anything to share on that. I, 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 besides, it is true that by the end of the year, I will be retiring from Amazon. That I, that I can confirm. OK, well, and you, you, you won't stay in technology? There's no Dave Limp startup on the horizon? Uh, I think the thing that I, I wrote it to the team, and so I can certainly tell you, uh, you know, I've done, I've been doing some version of this job for 30 years. I, I came straight out of undergraduate college. I went to Apple. I had such a good time there. I then went to Palm and other places. And uh, so I, I think I, I do have another chapter in my life. It's just not going to be consumer electronics. But, mm. uh, but beyond that, I just ask you to stay tuned. Mm, maybe venture calls your Azure Capital just before this role. David, great to have some time with you. Thank you, David. Thanks for the time. Yeah, of course, Senior Vice President of Amazon Devices and Services. Meanwhile, we want to dip back into what the IPO is up to. It's been such a busy couple of days when it comes to NASDAQ yesterday with Instagram today. It's New York Stock Exchange's time to shine. We're seeing ultimately another pop, Clavio going higher. Now, not as high as that have been indicated yeah, overall, Ed, but $60. certainly a notable 25% increase. They are managing to plan these IPOs to the nth degree. And the first SaaS or enterprise or software name in two years. And they trade at higher multiple. We have the Fed later today. Yeah. But we love an IPO. Shanali Basic laments that there won't be another one till Birkenstock, but it's been an amazing week. And just think it's not just about Birkenstock and retail there's going to be so many other technology companies in the background I remember speaking to Karen Snow over at Nasdaq saying that there's about 157 companies that have filed many of them technology as their root cause so if the windows genuinely opened we'll find out we'll see well for now it looks as though we've got a surge in trading stick with us that does it for this edition of Bloomberg Technology then. we cap the show on our podcast we get it on the terminal Apple Spotify and iHeart from New York City this is Bloomberg Technology